Hello, Stray viewer. My name is Monster Hunter, and I'm back from my hiatus, where instead of resting, I just made more scripts and practiced Adobe to improve my number of skills. Much like our hunters and current gen Monster Hunter who can overload themselves with a plethora of skills, essentially allowing for your hunter to roid out more than ever before and tackle those pesky G rank monsters. But is that necessarily a good thing? The other day on Twitter, I posted a satirical comment about inclusion of certain decorations and what I'll do if they don't show up on the next title update. Speaking of, go follow me on Twitter, link in the description below. I promise I'm more than likely one of the only non-combative or holier-than-thou game discussers there, Scout Honor. Plug aside, that post retweeted with quite the interesting take. OP states that attack boost, weakness exploit, critical eye, and critical boost should not be added as a level 4 decoration at all. Others commented that these skills should be removed from the game entirely. I inquired as to why, and after brief discussions with them, I left it be. Though, as time went on, I began thinking about it almost regularly. What is wrong with those skills? Is it the player's fault for using the tools that the developers gave us? What would be the best possible solution to fix this whole overloading pandemic, I guess? I once again took to Twitter to ask how others feel about the topic. Should these skills be nerfed or removed, or should the armor and decoration system be changed? Today, I'd like to discuss the accessibility of skills and the impact it has on the game and its community. We can't get to the meat and potatoes of this whole issue without talking about the skill system. Monster Hunter was quite a different game 18 years ago. It was, in fact, in its simplest yet most complicated form, but the gameplay loop was entertaining nonetheless. Gather materials, hunt monsters, make armor and weapons from said monsters and materials to fight stronger monsters and thus repeat the process until endgame. It is that grind at the end that really fleshes out the experience when you finally settle on a particular armor and weapon. Rather than just looking cool and providing you with defense and elemental resistances, armor also offers you skills. Skills are bonus abilities that provide you with various effects for use in hunts. Skills can be broken into several categories. Offensive skills, which affect your damage by increasing values such as base attack, element attack, affinity, and etc. Defensive skills that boost your ability to resist physical and elemental damage or incapacitations such as status effects. Lastly, utility skills are skills that assist with functions for gameplay, mechanics ranging from items to movement, and even weapon features. So how does all of this factor into the skill system? Well, long story short, it's how you're able to gain those skills. Before I begin, those of you who don't need the rehash, skip to the point I have labeled on screen. Previous generations operated on a skill point system. The skill point system works by having two components, one being the skill point and the other being the active skill. Because I'm a filthy switch axe abuser, I'm going to use focus as the example. The skill point is called fast charge. After acquiring 10 points of fast charge, it then becomes the active skill focus. Now compare that to the skill level system. All you have to do is simply equip an armor and you receive the benefit that the skill offers up to a maximum limit. The decoration system was altered as well. Pre-5th gen decorations granted skill points based on their jewel level. Jewel 1 granting 1 or 2 points depending on the skill. Jewel 2 granting 3 points. And Jewel 3 granting 4 points on average and 5 for select few skills. Armor with decoration slots worked as either 1, 2, or 3 slots to accommodate for the jewel types created. It was possible to acquire active skills purely off of decorations alone, so armor wasn't the end-all be-all. Current generation, however, has you outfit slots with decorations that are equal to or lesser than the decoration level, immediately giving you the points, and just like previous generations, you could also fill up a skill to its maximum level by just equipping decorations. With that taken care of, we can finally discuss what makes these differences so impactful. As I explained, for the skill point system, you need 10 points of a particular skill to activate. Not only that, some skills required 15 to 20 points to increase the initial effect of the active skill. Said skills are pretty much the stars of the whole conundrum. Attack boost and critical eye. Just getting the active skill at 10 points would only net you 10 bonus attack and 10% critical chance respectively. 
However, getting 20 points would reward you with 20 attack or 30% affinity, respectively again. This is quite difficult despite how simple it is to explain. I neglected to mention this earlier because I felt that now would have been the better time to explain it. Negative skill points accompanied many armor sets in nearly every decoration in previous generations. Negative skill points work the same as positive skill points, in that some skills, when they reach negative 10 or more, will present you with a harmful effect instead. Remember focus from earlier? Yeah, at negative 10, it grants the active skill distraction, which, as you might have already guessed, slows the time it takes for gauges and charges instead. Essentially, you would wear an armor or equip a decoration and lose skill points in another category. Maybe that was a skill you wanted to use, maybe it wasn't, but if you were slotting in decorations, you had to be very careful. Weakness exploit decorations give you negative points in health. This isn't as bad since it requires 10 negative points to actually lower your maximum health, and this can be easily avoided by equipping armor that has weakness exploit or health and keeping your health at 150 by just eating. Critical boost decorations, on the other hand, give you negative points in attack, which can complicate your ability to get critical boost alongside attack by limiting your armor and talisman choice in order to accommodate for the particular set you are trying to create. On average, most sets would acquire around four to five skills, and they're either full offense skills or a variety. Due to the limitations imposed on set building, one had to be very meticulous to find that perfect combination, and even then there were still drawbacks. The Josiana set is the perfect example of this. Comprised of Savage Devil Joe and Shogun Sienitar armor, you acquired skills that normally wouldn't be able to operate together. Sharpness and Handicraft While this is incredibly powerful, your defense and elemental resistance are sorely lacking, which means you have to be on top of your game because unlike someone else with mid 800 to maybe low 900 defense, may survive a hit with half to a quarter health while you may just cart on the spot. In fifth generation, there is no need to worry about that. If I want a set to have attack boost, critical eye weakness, exploit, and critical boost, then what's stopping me aside from limited deco slots? Hell, I can even throw in weapon specific skills like rapid morph, focus, power prolonger, and still have enough to spare utility like speed sharpening, recovery speed, wire bug whisper, protective polish. I mean, really, even a world lit would obliterate those 8,000 health G rank monsters in a matter of minutes. Except, they aren't 8,000 health monsters, are they? Balance in video games usually involves creating and or adjusting a value, mechanic, or behavior by increasing or decreasing certain aspects of a particular feature to avoid it from becoming too weak or too strong. True balance, however, is pretty much impossible to reach. The way devs would balance a PvP game is vastly different from how they would balance a PvE game. One has you correcting peer interaction, which you'll be able to pull much better results from with trends or community uproar. The other side can't be determined because in code, no one can hear you scream. Unless someone posts the footage of the slaughter and the devs see it. In our case, we're PvE and more specifically, Monster vs. Hunter. The devs had the foresight to know monsters can put up a fight if you let them get momentum on you, but with slowed action speed, plenty of unhealthy openings, and highly telegraphed attacks compared to abundance of skills, wire bug techniques, high base damage weapons, wyvern riding, endemic life, and just simple quality of life changes to mobility and features, and you already know where this went, <laughs> and most of you see where I'm going with this. Their solution? Up the monster health. And I mean like way up. Previous generations had regular monsters whose health were under 10,000 with the exception of some rare species, apexes, hypers, deviants, and tempered. The system back then didn't face these overpowering issues without cost, as I explained prior. For the monsters to survive more than 3 minutes against a regular player, they had to up the health in order to match the hunters. In high rank, monsters on average had 8,000 to over 10,000 health. You'd be thinking what the problem with that is? Well, them having more health means they aren't killed too fast. It's a more engaging fight, they're not easier to fight, but it actually does create a paradox of sorts. It's no secret that Capcom wanted to have the Monster Hunter series branch out beyond Japan, as it's been a sleeper hit up until Monster Hunter World. By doing so, they also brought in a host of new players. For some, they stay around and play the games quite often, others no life it, and then there's the casuals. 
These are the ones that just plug and play, only there because their friends play. They beat the game and drop it until a new update comes out so they can come back and then repeat the process, etc., etc. You know the type. Due to this, many of them don't know how to abuse sets or min-max their skills. They either pick what they like or follow whatever YouTuber makes a, and I quote this very harshly, build guide. In turn, they get washed when it comes to fighting these high health monsters, and in turn, these monsters with mechanics they don't understand because by default, they are going to do what they like. Kind of like the Alatreon controversy. This wasn't even something I had considered until Ramika said something about it. Ramika? Ramika? I don't know if I said that right. Speaking of, in the comments of my post, which weren't a lot, so take that with a grain of salt, most of the answers boiled down to either nerfing offensive skills or bringing back the old system. Oh, and don't forget to follow my Twitter or at least stalk the thread so you can read what the others were saying in greater detail, link down below. I feel that if we're gonna nerf the skill values themselves, they would in turn have to nerf the monster health as well. If we're doing less damage, but everything we fight is basically an Elder Dragon, then that'll sour the fun for everyone as a whole. Limiting how many skills you were able to acquire from armor, not just attached to the piece, but decoration slots as well, should also be able to curve that issue. Think about it. Flaming Asmanos chest and head are already level four attack, and God save my doubloons, if you have a talisman with two or three plus attack, you're pretty much set unless you're a switch X, in which case you gotta fit that rapid morph in there somewhere. It's still a viable option, that is, nerfing the skills and lowering the monster health. When it comes down to bringing back the old system, it would have to remain the exact same to still have that limiting potential. If it's just a combination of new world aspects on old world design, then it's going to just create the same issue. Like having five deco slots in the chest piece so you can fit a level two and a level three. But how would that fare with the new player base? My personal thoughts on the matter is that I would prefer the skill point system come back for Monster Hunter 6, but the objectivism in me understands it wouldn't be well received. I love a good challenge. I love to engage with the game at its best, to learn the system and overcome obstacles by being pushed to the limit and learning from not just doing the, the bare minimum of reading, but also failing. It's why I love Neo, Soulsborne, State of Decay, XCOM, Old World Monster Hunter, because they tell you how the game operates and then let go of your hand immediately. But I know that I'm not the end all be all. The sales are. With Monster Hunter World's release came its own issues. It was successful, and that's good, but as I got cussed out for pointing out on Twitter, it's also brought in different personalities to the fold. This is not exclusive to Monster Hunter. Anytime something goes viral, it attracts all types of people and personalities. Not all of them are explicitly good or bad. To the company, what's best for the individual or the core fan base isn't as important as what's best for the sales. If they bring back the skill point system or even just a Kinsec jelly, there could be strong backlash. Backlash in the form of toxic positivity from longtime stands, similar to Pokemon's community, or people who think Monster Hunter World was the first, best, and only Monster Hunter game to exist and being turned off when they see complexity. I would love for developers to follow what From Software and Koei Tecmo do to find a sweet blend that doesn't sacrifice the complexity and depth of a game and its system for simplicity and hand-holding. But that's wishful thinking because at the end of the day, it's still a business. And unless the Monster Hunter devs decide to hook them in with Generation 5 and then really reel them in with Generation 6, then we may just be seeing more of the skill level system in the future. Hopefully at a toned down rate. Hopefully, uh, hopefully a lot less uh, crazy than what we're currently doing. If you enjoyed this video and have some thoughts on the matter, why not like and leave a comment below? If you want to see more analytical or discussion-based videos on Monster Hunter, then go ahead and subscribe because I do have a load more scripts written on some topics that aren't always as mildly spicy as this. If not, no big deal. This has been Monster Hunter, and I'll see you in the next one.